We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. It's Wednesday at uh, 5 p.m. And that means it's the movie show uh, with George Kaysen. George and I talk about movies. We review one movie every week and, uh, and we go from there. And it's really a potpourri of movies. It's very diverse what we do. And uh, this movie is a very interesting movie. The movie we're going to review today, it's called The Tender Bar. Mm-hmm. And it's about, um, I guess, a, a family love story. I mean, it's not just romantic love. In fact, I don't think it is romantic love. It's family love. Yeah. And uh, it goes through, it's epical. It goes through, you know, 20, 30 years of, of family. And um, it's, it, it touches you. Doesn't it? It touches you, doesn't it, George? Yes, it's a very touching movie about a young kid and coming of age. So we'll talk about it, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about, uh, you know, who put it together. George Clooney directed it. Yeah. And I have a great regard for him the way he did this, because this is a, a sort of an elegant movie. It's a simple movie, but it's an elegantly simple movie. Yeah. And um, my hero is Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck has been in a number of movies lately. Um, and, you know, he's much more than what you might have thought he was. He's a good actor. And he can, can portray complex roles and situations. And, and uh, he, more than anyone in the movie, he touches you. And he is, he is the tender bar. But George, what is a tender bar anyway? Tender bar is a bar that's run, owned and run by his maternal uncle, Charlie. And it's just a few doors away from from where he's living with his grandfather and grandmother. And a lot of the kids of those two are back at home because of financial reasons, including his mother and himself. And... um, his father is sort of famous, a disc jockey on WORFM, um, well known, has a, a stage name as well, but is absent because when he was when the seven years old, the, the seven months old, the father absconded and they got divorced. So he really doesn't know his father. He only hears his father on the radio at night and he knows that's his father's. From what I read, his father had a beautiful voice, right? So everybody, the public really liked him, you know, this disc jockey. So this is this, how the story starts. And his f- uncle, Charlie, becomes like a surrogate father to him. And also his grandfather. And we'll, we can get into that. His grandfather takes, has taken the place at school and at, at the school event for, for, the, for his father who's absent. And just l- once or twice, his father comes around, you know, and uh, when the kid's doing well, doing well or something, he comes around, but sort of absent father. And we can get into, I want to get into, it's really a very good uh, acting by Ben Affleck. All the players played really good. It's very, it gets to your heart uh, how this little kid finally, it doesn't quite get to the law school that his mother wanted him to do, but he becomes a writer, he gets into Yale and she didn't have much money. She was just a secretary, right? And she lived in different places, and I'll get into that too. Um, you know, she she didn't have a lot of money, but they were all back at the grandfather's house, and so I'll let I'll give it I'll hand it over to you, Jay. But I have more to say about the locations. Yeah, okay. Well, we talk about the locations, but I want to talk about you know the dynamic of the characters. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can tell good art, and for that matter, good movies yeah. when the characters evolve. That they're they're not static. They're not flat. Uh, they change right in front of you. And in this case, uh, the young boy, and this one actor plays the young boy. Uh, and then the, the, the older boy, uh, who is, you know, jump ahead, what, 10 or 15 years. And um, he's another actor. Um, and of course, you know, there's a change there. And his um, you know, trajectory is he goes from being a, a really smart kid to a really smart student. Yeah. And uh, his mother wants him to go to Yale, which would take him out of this this, uh, you know, uh, sort of crummy, kooky life they lead uh, and into another world. She wants to go to Yale. She wants to go to law school, too. Um, And so you see the dynamic of the kid trying to find himself. And he's the he's the center of the movie. Yeah. Um, And you you love him because he's trying to find himself. And he's he's an he's an honest individual. Mm -hmm. And you love Ben Affleck, the uncle, because Ben Affleck is so tender-hearted maybe that's why they call the the bar the tender bar, tender bar yeah. because ben affleck plays this wonderful role yeah, yeah. Of, of the uncle who cares so much about this boy and then this man 
and uh, he he plays uh, as you said he he becomes the father, and he gives the the kid more than a father could give. I mean, an uncle can be very close to you. This is a study of uncles. It's a study of um, of how much sacrifice he made for the boy, how much he taught the boy, how much the boy depended on him. Uh, you know, even in stressful times. And and Ben Affleck was the owner of the bar, had you know financial issues about the bar, and um, you know he grew in the movie. He grew from just an ordinary bartender type of guy to a fellow who was the center of the little community, you know, their little family, so to speak. And the people in the bar were all part of that family. So, um, you know, you see a dynamic with Ben Affleck. And at the end of the movie, he, he, has, he has this car, this ridiculous, great big cruiser convertible car that he had like all his life. And he gives the keys to the boy. This is a symbolic act of, of a great prof profundity. Um, so you watch the car. You watch this movie. You got to you got to watch the car. And then his grandfather. I uh, forget the name of the actor, but this guy. Oh, it's is, something Lloyd. Yeah. He's he's like out of his mind. Yeah. Um, and Back to the Future is where he made his his bones. Then he plays the role of the grandfather who lets all these people come into his house, uh, and cause they don't have another place to go. And, and he owns the house, and <clears throat> he acts as their oh I don't know their their landlord. In a sense, uh, uh, you know, the, he's, he's the boss of the family, but he's out of his mind and a very kooky guy. And what's interesting is that he also evolves. He's not static either. He changes. He understands that he needs to be involved. He needs to help the boy. He needs to be more than just a kooky guy. Uh, and he actually becomes more reasonable, more of a member of the family, more of a, a loving member of the family with the boy and the boy. You know, the boy needs that and he provides it. So it's a very dynamic role also. Uh, they all have dynamics. And that's, the, you know, the example of uh, good writing and good directing. Uh, so the movie, you know, it, it just seems like a simple movie, but it's not a simple movie at all. And Ben Affleck, is, it seems like a simple character, a bartender, a big deal. But it's not simple at all. We're talking about honest feelings here. But if you want to, if you want and I'll stop in a minute, but, the, you know, the most interesting part of the movie, I think, is when he goes to Yale and early on he runs into this African-American, Hapa African-American woman, yeah. uh, who is as classy as it gets. Yep. She is so beautiful and classy, mm -hmm. and he falls head over heels for her, and he, he's willing to do anything for her, devote his life for her. And, you know, you can understand that because how beautiful and classy she was, but it doesn't work. And it's such, it, it, it's so painful to watch her dump on him over and over and over again. And you want them to get together. You want there to be a real romance here. He just can't pull it off. My favorite scene in the movie, though, and I'll stop after this, is when, uh, I know how to use this in a, in a family show, um, but she says to him on their date, she says to him um, uh, at the end of that date, you know, uh, uh, that part of the date where you're supposed to, you know, kiss your date and all that and leave her at the doorstep. He says, she says to him, have you ever mm, effed uh, in a Volvo? <laughs> whereupon, whereupon they have sex in the Volvo. Now, She's later on, yeah. he has a dinner with her fancy family in their fancy house. Yes. Uh, the father is a uh, Howley architect. The mother is a black architect, yeah. and they're both very snooty, both of them. Yes. And they're having this dinner. And you remember? Kinetic. It's just an amazing scene. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, they are dumping on him because he doesn't come from a big-name family, you know, a crazy family. Although he's at Yale, they should have given him recognition for that. And uh, at the end of this dinner, he closes the dinner by saying, you know, Mr. What's-your-name, um, have, you, have you ever effed in a Volvo? Yeah. indicating that he and his daughter, uh, the, the man's daughter, have, have done exactly that. I mean, it is a real showstop. Yeah. It, and, you know, and that brings me to the point, there's a lot of very funny lines yeah. in this in the show, but that doesn't make it any less profound. Your thoughts? Yeah, you know, not to get it. I did have a similar issue when I was dating an African-American woman, but I won't get into it from a very wealthy family. So... But that was a different story. But bottom line is, the storyline is wonderful. 
it's heart wrenching that that how this kid, you know, doesn't get to to the law school, but he does get to Yale. But I have issues, like you alluded to in the in the in the thing, the introduction to the show. It's Manhasset is not Lowell, Massachusetts. It the, the bar was just four doors or five doors away. Um, and it, the, bar, the bar they show is in Beverly, Massachusetts. So, and the people that played the roles, right? Their acting was good, but it wasn't. This is this wasn't an, a, a, an, act, a, a depi- a accurate depiction of Manhasset, of the bar, of the grandparents' house, or of the people. You know. So, uh, Max, can you bring up? Uh, the first um, link that I I, I, I sent you, the, yeah. Now here's the, the the real face and the um, the real face, and go down. The first one, as you scroll down, the first one is is the kid. It was J. R. Mo, uh, Mohinger, Mohinger, who is the author of the of the book that they. Oh, that's right. You must you must tell our audience uh, how real this is. This is based on a, on it, memoirs. Yes, that were written up of this, uh, you know, this person's Mo- Moringer, is it? Moringer, um, right, exactly. And he, he wrote a book. He wrote a book yeah. of his yeah. own life. Yeah. And it was his memoirs. And this movie is taken off the his life as expressed in that book. So in a exactly. sense, it's it's a, you know it's it's a it's a movie about him. Autobiographical movie. That's what it. That's what it's based. Ostensibly, that's it. And then you have uh, the next face is is Moringer in his teenage years, and then go down, and then the woman who played Lily Rabe, who plays the, the mother role, and then the real picture of the mother, and then the guy who plays the bad father, and then the real picture of Johnny Michaels, who was the DJ, right? And then I think that's, yeah, and, and then scroll down, that's, that's basically the real J.R. Moshinger as a young kid, and then the picture of the actor who plays the, the older J.R. Okay, ne- next, um, Sa- uh, Max, if you could just bring up the first uh, photo, the first picture of that bar in, in um, what's it, um, Beverly, Massachusetts. This is the bar that was shown in the movie, the Dickens Bar, right? Take a look at that, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? That's in, in uh, Beverly, Massachusetts. Probably, you can tell, sort of a poor community. Max, get, show the next slide, please. This is the publican's bar in Manhasset, which was just a few doors away from the house where the Maguires lived, the grandfather and grandmother. And this is the publican's bar. This is in Manhasset, which I know very well because I was dating a woman in the 70s. This was based in the 70s in Manhasset. This is on Plandome Road, 550 Plandome Road in Manhasset. That's the bar in an affluent community. Now, Max, the next one, please. Oh, yeah. Now, this is the... 27 um, Parkview uh, Road in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, where the filming was of the Ramshackle House, right? Where this was filmed. Now, then show the next, Max, go to the next slide. This is the grandparents' house. Now, it might have not been in this shape in 1970s, but th- this is, it's on Plandome Road in Manasset. That's the house now, you know? That's pretty spiffy. It's a small house, but it's, it's not right run down in it. I know that neighborhood, very affluent neighborhood. Okay, so if, so then go 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 to the next. Uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, the real Uncle Charlie, right? Uh, uh, not a real, you know. This is the real Uncle Charlie, uh, Charles McGuire, the uncle, right? Sort of different than the one that, that they show the guy that portrayed it. And I think that's the. Is that the last slide? I, I Max, that I I think the other two, yeah. That's the last slide. Okay, so bottom line, storyline, wonderful, heart-wrenching, wonderful. But Manhasset, I mean, this J.R. Murringer, he probably went to grade school in Manhasset, which has very, very high um, schools, you know, really trains those kids good. And then they moved to Arizona. I think they were in Scottsdale, Arizona. His mother was alone, you know, she was, she was a single mother. Now, she had been a secretary, and I think I, I looked her up, Dorothy Murringer, and she lived in, in a cheap apartment in Farmingdale, which is a where I grew up. It's a poor neighbor, poorer neighborhood, and maybe either as a single woman or just with the kid, right? So she moved back into her dad and mom's place in Manhasset. But this is depicted 
you know, they, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. What they're showing is the bar. And what they're showing is the ramshackle house. Really, there's a little bit of lack of truth there. And he didn't grow up completely in, in Manhasset. He went, they went to Arizona. He went to high school in Arizona, J.R. Orange. And then he moved to Berkeley and, you know, became famous as a writer, worked Orange County Register. After he went to Yale. After he went to Yale. Now, the thing is, the scenes of, with that, Af, uh, that classy African-American woman, very, very real. Because, I mean, even in, when I lived in L.A., Baldwin Hills, wealthy blacks, you know, wealthy. I knew I had friends from that neighborhood in Baldwin Hills, which is a very affluent black neighborhood. So that was very accurate. And Connecticut, where it was filmed, that's really accurate. That's very affluent. So location wise issues, but not Connecticut. So so that's pretty much now if you get into the storyline a little more and I'll, I'll just a little more time with this. Let me stop you for a minute. Sure. I, sure. I have a theory about this. Yeah. OK, um, they they could have made the movie in Manhasset, but they chose not to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, I think there's two reasons for that. So they went to Massachusetts for maybe a lower scale neighborhood than Manhasset, as you showed in the photos. Yeah. Um, but I think there's two possible mm, reasons for that. One is that we're talking about the 70s, really, uh, when he was a kid, when, when they were living in that house together. Yeah. And that might have been Manhasset in those days. Manhasset now is a better neighborhood. I mean, a lot of neighborhoods, no, don't you think? A lot of neighborhoods in, in Long Island, North Shore of Long Island, got to be better neighborhoods from then till now. I mean, the money came in, the, the jobs in Manhattan, the, you know, the classic uh, com commuter executive person uh, at Manhasset was not a bad place. If you roll it back, maybe it was not quite as good a place. The other thing is, Okay, maybe they went to you know Massachusetts because he was he was trying to that is uh, um, uh, George Clooney was trying to establish the essence of the family, the essence of the house, and he wanted you to see it as a kooky you know <laughs> down 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 home kind of place, uh, and and what he was saying I think. And I'm sure what he was saying is, you know, this location that I found, this venue that I found in Massachusetts is more accurate for the way these people lived than a current view, a current movie maker view of the town of Manhattan. And I want to show a certain gestalt about the way they lived in his house. I want to show a, a certain gestalt about the bar. And the way they interacted, you know, with their patrons and friends in the bar. Um, so I'm going to show you what I think truly represents the memoirs, uh, rather than the physical place. I'm, I'm taking you on a journey that I feel is more accurate. I don't think they're trying to deceive us. Uh, I think they're trying to give us the, you know, call it poetic license, uh, the license of the filmmaker, the license of the author. That's what. Yeah, the, the, the reason that I, from what I read is Ben Affleck is from the Massachusetts, Boston area, right? And maybe Clooney, because Affleck was the number one star, he, he filmed it there because Affleck would feel comfortable with those neighborhoods. He, he knew those neighborhoods. He had an affiliation, of, you know, with those neighborhoods and it was like going back for him. So he would be a better actor in those neighborhoods. So that might be part of it. But... Uh, not to disagree with you, I was going with this woman, April, in, Mass in Manhasset, and I used to drive up Plandome Road. And even back in the 70s, because I left for California in 78, this was in the middle 70s. And even then, Manhasset was, is was, and even then was very wealthy. We're talking one of the most affluent neighborhoods on Long Island. So the whole North Shore was. A whole great you can name any number of uh, towns like Manhattan. And, yeah. and I, I lived in Queens. And, uh, you know, any one of them was really uh, to aspire to. Right. From uh, Douglas oh, yeah, it lives on the North Shore, a big deal. Yeah, um, yeah. But so, I, I mean, mean yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 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 what, the thing that was pictured in Lowell, that house, was more Hicksville or downtown Farmingdale or someplace like that, you know, more of a less affluent. But I knew Plandome Road, and it was 646 Plandome Road was the house, 550 Plandome Road was the bar. It was like 142 steps between the bar and the house so the kid could go to the bar. And those guys in the bar, like you said, for the gestalt, 
I don't think that many, that, those kind of guys were at that bar. I think it was a more upscale kind of clientele, As, unless, unless they were drawing clientele from other parts of Long Island. But, you know, there's you know, I was talking to my wife about that, you know, and we know that Ben Affleck is a kind of Irishman. Yeah. Clooney, I think, is the same. And, uh, you know, Boston is Irish. And, and if, you, if you looked at some of, um, some of Ben Affleck's other movies, um, you know, I saw one last night called Town. He plays the role of, a, you know, an Irish, an Irish gang guy. But he does wonderful work with that. Yeah. The Irish, the whole Boston thing. Ben Affleck has it. And so I think they were trying to capture that. Yes, yes. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, they successfully did so. The people in the bar, uh, you know, it's like, you think of a bar, a dark bar, right? A bar where people drink too much, a bar where they spend too much time. Yeah. And that's what, he was trying to demonstrate that. But at the same time, they were trying to demonstrate a bar where everyone knew each other. It was the proverbial, you know, Boston uh, neighborhood bar. Yeah. It was like a pub. Everybody yeah. was acquainted with everybody, and and there were there were no there was nothing wrong happening there. Uh, it was just an extension of, uh, of of their lives. And getting back to the relationship between the kid and the uncle, right? He was giving them a, him a lot of knowledge about how to treat women, how to how to run your life how to study, how to do this, how to do that. All the things that normally a father would do that with this absent, you know, disc jockey. So, so he, he's filling him in and that he, all that training helped him when he went to the, uh, to the was it New York Times um, to be, he went for a job there, you know, and initially they rejected him because all his, I mean, initially and finally also yeah they ultimately fired him fired him <laughs> because they said too many of his he was too green you know and 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 it's too um, you know and and all his stories were about bars but eventually when he wrote this memoir that the book that this movie is about that was his claim to fame even though he had been a reporter for a few newspapers in la but that was his claim to fame that he wrote this 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 memoir, and that made him famous because it was turned into a into a movie, a screenplay, and a movie. So, uh, I agree with you that it, for the Gestalt, right? Massachusetts bar, the uh, bar they filmed it, and the house they filmed it was the basic feelings that 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 J. R. Moringer had expressed. I think he wasn't really being realistic, you know. No, you know, I think what it was, I mean, you know, we this is an interesting experience and we ought to mention it, you know. So if you were to sit down, George, or yeah. if I were to sit down, yeah. uh, you know, at our age and look back and write memoirs about how life was in the formative years in school with family and all the stress and strain of family and, yeah. and having uncles, you know, most of us have uncles of one kind or another. Yeah. How do we get along with them? How do they compete with our parents? Uh, who was providing the nutrition and who wasn't. Yeah. I mean, families are very complicated animals. Yeah. Um, you know, we might see it differently than the actual physical properties. Yeah. We, might, we might see it, uh, you know, different. And, and that's, I think, what they were trying to achieve, that he was trying to achieve. He had, you know, if, if you looked at your, if your life, um, you would pick a place that was somehow in your mind's eye your recollection may be different than the actual place you were at um, to, to better capture, you know, your experience of growing up. The other, the other thing about growing up is that, you know, he was not his own man. He was very smart. He had intuitive skills. He was brilliant as a kid, um, but it wasn't helping him much. And he was getting advice from all these people, as you say, from his uncle and and from his mother, who was very motivated, it was a great scene about the letter that he got from Yale. <laughs> his uncle had the letter. Want Nobody it. wanted to open the letter. <laughs> carefully opened the letter, carefully, you know, unfolded it and read it ever so slowly. And it said, "Is with great pleasure that we advise you. You have been accepted in the class of what 1986 yeah. as." <laughs> As a um, as a you know a student at Yale, and we'll pay your way too. Exactly. Um, it was it was the kind of letter you love to get. 
Right. Uh, so uh, I guess what, what I'm saying is uh, these are the high points of his memoirs. If you were to write your memoirs, they wouldn't be exactly accurate. They would be through the lens of time and history and everything that has taken place in your life since then. Yeah. Uh, and it would be different. It wouldn't be the same. It would be with the benefit of all that you've learned then and since then. So, and I know I would have the same experience. It would be, it would be colored by my entire life experience. And I think that's what we have here. So I think, um, you know, he's trying to tell us more than just a photographic look at, at, at this kid. The other, the other part is I said, um, he, you know, he was being pulled this way and that way, didn't really have the kind of family structure you'd like to see. Without his uncle, he would have been in bad shape actually. Um, with his uncle, better but not complete. And his mother had this thing about sending him to Yale no matter what, and then requiring that he go to law school no matter what. And so the big crunch point was he gave her Yale, but he didn't give her law school. At, at some point, uh, he managed to live without, without this love interest. At some point, he managed to say to his mother, I'm not going to law school, you, you know, I'm not going to do it. Sorry, not going to do it. And this was the emergence of the complete individual. This is the emergence of the fellow who knew where he was and where he was going. And, yep. and, and we, all, we all learned from that. Yep, yep. So true that he knew, he knew who he was and he didn't have to go to law school. I mean, that was, he found himself, you know. But it was, it was the formative years with his uncle and his mother and his grandparents that really did it. And uh, a lot of kids who grow up without a father, my dad grew up without a father, there's sort of a big hole there. You know, his aunt, my dad's uncle sort of took the place, you know, but um, maternal uncle. So, yeah, so I, I totally- His father in, this, in, this, um, in the memoirs and in the movie was really a bum. Um, he was, uh, he, 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 they went to a restaurant together and his father said, I've gotten off uh, alcohol. And then his father wound up drinking up a storm Sad. without eating in the restaurant. And then he says to his son, he says, uh, let's go home so I can introduce you to my latest poontang. Yeah. And <laughs> my wife said, what's that mean? Well, <clears throat> it means that he didn't think too much of his girlfriend. Right. Uh, and then they got into this uh, ridiculous uh, fight where, whereupon the son called the police on his father. Right. Have yeah. him come down and arrest his father. And then he left. And, uh, you know, it tells you the nature of his relationship with his father was very damaged. Chris's yeah. father was a damaged human being. Was a junkie, yeah. Not a bad, a bad guy, yeah. Yeah. So what would you say, you know, you carried away from this movie? I mean, to me, I think it's a movie about love. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, love in a family. Not having that available to you. Not having a father, really. Um, having, having people who support you and want you to succeed. Yeah. And um, and then somehow you you deal with all these you know different stresses and strains and and you find yourself this is not easy to write about um, you know even if it's first person and it's not easy to make a movie about it um, but I think I think we learn something from this about how to how to cope with life decisions how to cope with family sometimes very kooky sometimes really off the wall um, but but. But there's enough love, at least from his uncle, yeah. that gives him sustenance and makes him a, a real person. It's tolerance. It's understanding. It's um, it's uh, you know it's unconditional. That's what this movie yeah. is about. Yes, how true. Very heartwarming story. Yeah, I, I like I like the storyline. I, I I liked everything about it. You know, uh, Ben Affleck acting really good. All the actors and actresses were. Par, you know, par excellence. They were really good. So it, was, it leaves you with a good feeling at the end. I mean, I felt a little, and I wish he had gone to law school, but that's from my own perspective. I wish he had gotten the girl. That, that was so tragic. I mean, he tried so hard. Uh, and uh, she was really a wonderful, wonderful girl. But, but he just didn't have it. And every time he returned to try to capture her, she was dating someone else. And it was somebody her parents wanted her to date. Yeah. <laughs> that was, was that really was too bad. Yeah. And, you know, we've all been through that, haven't we? I mean, this, it's not like, uh, you know, the, he's the only one who had that kind of issue. Um, and this sh shows you that, you, yes, you can, you can get by anyway. Yeah. It's all right. 
you can you can uh, you can move on. Move on, right? Yeah. So it's a new genre for me. It's a new genre for certainly about Ben Affleck. Yeah. It's a new genre about you know personal stories. Yeah. There was and, and this this is very important. There was no violence and no vengeance. There was there was no dark nineteen forty seven kind of gangster thing in this movie at all. This was just ordinary people living ordinary lives and teaching you about their lives, it, uh, as opposed to so many other movies that are on Netflix and Prime um, that are just filled with violence and vengeance. So in that sense, it was very refreshing, don't you think? Definitely. Something light after all the other ones we've been, movies, you know, the Ukraine situation, all the people getting killed and all the other ones we were doing, world events that were really sad. This is sort of uplifting a nice break from all that, you know, because it gets, I mean, we have to deal with all these horrible things in the world. And this was just sort of something that was uplifting, you know, in, in a way. So it, it, it helps to have that break. Definitely, definitely. So so uh, what do you think of, what, what would you give this from a one to 10? Hmm. I'd give it a nine. Yeah. How about you? Uh, I... I liked it even more. I would give it a, a 10. Whoa, wow, George. I didn't realize. Okay, yeah. good. good I mean, you. even though even though the, I have that issue with the, uh, you know, a lot of wealthy people, like you said, they look back. He was looking back from success and living in Berkeley and all his success to where he grew up. But it, it's all a matter of perspective, you know, because for me growing up in Farmingdale, Manhasset was, so I mean, from my perspective, he grew up in a fancy neighborhood, you know, even if the house might have been a little run down, right? But the schools were phenomenal in Manhasset. And, and I mean, from dating that woman in Manhasset, I knew, I mean, it wasn't that house was nothing compared to theirs. I mean, Plandome, you know, that's filthy rich Flower Hill. So, I, so it, it's a perspective, looking back from when he was writing, where he grew up was sort of maybe, as you said, his perspective was different, you know? So he looked at it as poverty, but I don't think it was that. I mean, his mother was a, a secretary. She probably had a cheap apartment in Farmingdale, even when she was single or before she moved in, back into her father's place. But, but his perceptions in success would, and a lot of wealthy people look back to their, to their earlier life and, and successful people. And I think their perceptions are a little distorted that it really wasn't that bad. <laughs> so leave it at that. But I like this movie, leave it at that. So you gave it a nine, I'll give it a 10. Um, okay, I wanna add one other thing. Um, yeah. If you ask me what this movie teaches me, why I, I liked it as much as I did, yeah. um, maybe you have a different answer, but I think it tells us that our lives, your life, my life, are unique. They belong to us. They're not perfect. Nobody has a perfect life. Um, and you have a duty to yourself to see your life as your special property. However, it worked out. You were alive. You learned stuff. You met people. You had relationships. You know, um, all of that. And you have to see that as a valuable asset that is unique to you. And you also have to look back down the road um, you know, and and not regret any of it um, because it is unique to you. And I think everybody should do that. Everybody should look back down the road and, and do memoirs, whether he was ultimately, whether the writer of the memoirs was ultimately uh, successful or not. He didn't strike me as a guy who was immodest in any way. I think, it, you know, this view of his life is a very modest view. It's, a, it's an attempt to be honest and all that. Um, but I think we all should do that, and we all should write our, our own memoirs, whether we publish them or make a movie about them or not. We should write them in our minds. We should write them even down on paper and, and examine why we have just as good, a, just an interesting a family, just as good a set of relationships as this guy had. Definitely. I, I'm going to write my memoirs. I think it'd be a blockbuster movie. I've got a really interesting life. We'll get into that sometime. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was good, Jay. You're, you're, you're always really on right on the ball. You know, you understand, understand these things, deep understandings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, we don't know what we're going to cover next time, George, but we will find out. Okay. And so will our audience find out and it will be mm, something unusual, something different. 
It will not be, I assure you, it will not be violence and vengeance. <laughs> Great. Enough, enough, enough sadness in this world. Yeah. Uh, gets worse every every year. George Kaysen and I trying to find value in, in an ongoing an ongoing art form. There was an article in the Times recently about how movies are losing it to cable. And so when we talk about Netflix or um, Prime or any of the other uh, cable subscription services, we're talking about the future of movies. That's where it's at, not in the theaters, I'm sorry to say. Uh, we're in a new genre now, and George and I are going to uh, explore that in great detail going forward. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, Jay. Thank you again. Thanks for your insights. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.